Hello, my name is Asha Sampath. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the IUCN launch of the first ever global standard for nature-based solutions. Well, I first uh, personally discovered IUCN when I was working on my CNBC show, Sustainable Energy, this year. And obviously our 2020 theme this year is nature-based solutions, of course. So this is definitely a topic that I have spent some time on trying to understand its many benefits. So the IUCN is a membership union composed of both government and civil society organizations working in almost 160 countries. It is also the global authority on the status of the natural world and the measures needed to safeguard it. Well, today we have a distinguished panel of speakers spanning several regions and time zones, and we are lucky to have them. And of course, we have several questions that we would like to ask about this new IUC and global standard. Why is it important and how can it help us address today's pressing challenges on climate change, biodiversity loss, food security, and other societal problems. And to help us kick off this event, I would like us to hear first from IUCN's Vice President, Anna Tira, who provided us a brief message from her home in the Cook Islands. Thank you, Asha, on the introduction. Fiorana, and greeting to you all. As the Vice President of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, I proudly welcome all of you to this momentous occasion, the launch of IUCN's Global Standard on Nature-Based Solutions. Nature-Based Solutions Standard is informed by over 20 years of work and experiences carried out by IUCN, its partners and members. The use of ecosystem management approaches to derive both biodiversity and societal benefits who approaches such as ecosystem-based adaptation, sustainable land management, or forest landscape restoration is the foundation upon which nature-based solutions is defined. In 2016, IUCN members, almost 1,000 government and non-government entities adopted a formal definition for nature-based solutions. IUCN was also mandated to formulate guidance to deploy the concept with clarity and consistency. Since then, we have seen a growing momentum on nature-based solutions globally, reaffirming this timely launch of the standard. The Nature-Based Solutions Group, led by Stuart McGuinness and IUCN's Commission on Ecosystem Management, shared by Angela Andrade, and both of whom are on the two panels today, have been leading a two-year process involving inputs from over 800 people from across 100 countries that has resulted in the standard we are launching today. While it is a moment to celebrate, we must not forget that during these two years, we have also witnessed even further worsening of the climate and biodiversity crisis. Also, as the standard was being finalized the past month, we faced and are still living through yet another crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. The importance of finding ways to meet our needs through sustainable use of this planet resources had been amplified through all these events and is of particular significance as countries prepare to build back from the pandemic. An opportune time to build back better through building back greener. The standard can help facilitate this much needed transition towards a decarbonized, greener and more sustainable world that can at the same time support societal needs and biodiversity well-being. We will hear from the panelists on how existing partnerships and efforts can be built upon and new alliances can be forged so that we fully leverage the potential of nature-based solutions through the deployment of the standard. 
With these words, I welcome you to the launch and hope you enjoy this event. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anatira. All the way from the Cook Islands was uh, great to, to listen to this opening message. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker uh, today, the Honorable Wallace Cosgrove from the Republic of the Seychelles, who will speak a little bit about the relevance of nature-based solutions in Africa and for island states. Uh, as a reminder, the Seychelles is one of uh, a growing number of countries worldwide using nature-based solutions to strengthen its resilience to cha changing climate. Minister Cosgrove, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Vice President of the IUCN, Excellencies, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of Seychelles government, I wish to thank the IUCN for the invitation to participate in this event for the launch of the Global Standards for Nature-Based Solutions. It is no doubt a very important standard for the whole world. Locally, the IUCN remains an important partner. And as a member of the union, we are guided by a lot of the work and standards set. Although we are only launching the standard today, it must be said that Seychelles and a number of other countries, including small island developing states, as well as countries in Africa, has always believed that the solutions to most of our challenges and our survival depends and lies with nature. In many of our countries, our people are still very much connected to nature. Seychelles, due to our smallness and vulnerability, have always attached great importance to the protection and preservation of nature, and as much as possible, look towards nature for protection and adaptation, but also for our livelihoods when it comes to economic activities, as well as survival needs of our people. Through activities such as fisheries and tourism activities, our natural environment remains our most important asset. Developmental policies are centered around environmental protection and preservation. We have always had a very strong uh, policy of protecting our natural environment. Today, we have over 48% of our land territory legally protected. And we have earlier this year designated 30% of our exclusive economic zone as marine protected areas. This is a direct indication of our belief in nature, that nature can protect and provide and that all our activities has to be done in a sustainable manner. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change remains a significant threat to SIDS and African countries. It threatens our economies and our livelihoods, and the livelihoods of our people. The solution to adaptations are ecosystems based and lies in nature. Seychelles has put a lot of efforts in this over several decades, specifically in the protection of marine ecosystems such as coral reefs, seagrass, mangroves. In the long run, we believe this is the most cost-effective approach, approach to tackling climate change, especially for us small island developing states. Finally, to sustain and enable all this to continue, Seychelles has undertaken significant work, such as, such as the formulation of one of the largest marine spatial planning exercises to ensure that nature is protected but also activities happening in our EZ are effectively planned and conducted, again, with strong consideration for nature. All this has to be financed. Again, Seychelles has been brave to embark on different innovative financing schemes, such as the debt swap for nature and adaptation and the blue bonds to sustain all these efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, for us in Seychelles, there has never been any doubt that nature-based solutions is the best approach and the way to go. It is our hope that the standard, that with the standard, this can be promoted and implemented widely. On our side, certainly we will consider in the implementation and application of the concept nationally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. So I'm very close to this topic as an islander myself, Mauritian born. So obviously everything you said really spoke to me. Thank you very much. Well, for another perspective, uh, we would like to invite uh, the Right Honourable Lord Goldsmith from the UK to tell us what his government is doing as the hosts of the next global climate change meeting. Now, 
actually postponed until 2021. So thank you for joining us. Um, the UK as host for the next climate meeting. How does your government plan to continue to work with all the involved parties, countries to include, increase climate actions, build resilience and lower emissions? I don't know, Lord Goldsmith, if, if you are, I can't see you, but you should be. Can you hear me? Ah, perfect, <laughs> lovely, <laughs> great. It's good to have you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, look, thank you so much, uh, thanks for the introduction. And it, it's, um, it's great to be here, to have been invited and particularly to follow the Honorable Cosgrove from Seychelles. The Seychelles, as he said, have provided real leadership in, in so many different ways. Um, so it's a, wonderful to follow him. Um, as with all speeches nowadays, the backdrop clearly is COVID-19 because its impacts have been so profound and because it affects everything. But it's also, I think, and I hope, a wake-up call, because after all, COVID is itself a symptom of our abusive relationship towards the natural world. And as we scramble to find a vaccine, quite rightly, we would do well to consider that the only way that we can truly inoculate ourselves against future pandemics is by profoundly resetting that relationship with nature. Because without a fundamental change, far, far worse is to come. And right now, you will know there are around a million species facing extinction. It, in the five minutes or so, so if the five minutes or so in which I'm speaking to you now are representative of the usual five minutes, then during the course of my speech, we will have lost around 150 football pitches worth of forests. And in fact, this year could be worse because in the first four months of 2020, we're told that deforestation in the Amazon rainforest, for instance, was 50% higher than the same period last year. And our ocean, meanwhile, as we've already heard, is being choked with so much rubbish that by 2050, it will contain more plastic than fish as measured by weight. The truth is, as we know, we are undermining our very foundations. And while it's a tragedy in and of itself, from an ecological point of view, it's also a human tragedy, given the very direct dependence all of us have, but in particular, the world's most vulnerable people on the free services that nature provides. So as co-hosts of the next Climate COP, the government's focus naturally will be on clean energy, zero emissions vehicles, finance, adaptation and resilience, and so on, but at its core, will be a major emphasis on nature. We know that you cannot solve climate change without restoring and protecting nature on a massive scale. The two crises are inextricably linked. In effect, they're one crisis. crisis. Um, and indeed, we know that there is no pathway to net zero or the sustainable development goals that does not involve a massive scale up of nature-based solutions. They could provide over a third of the cost-effective climate change mitigation that we need, while also helping communities adapt, reversing biodiversity loss, tackling poverty around the world. But despite that huge contribution that we know nature-based solutions can make, just 3% of global climate funding is invested in nature. And that makes no sense whatsoever. Our prime minister in the UK has committed to doubling our international climate finance to 11.6 billion. But even more importantly, much of that uplift is going to be invested in nature-based solutions, and we want other countries to do the same. Um, and this much-anticipated global standard that, that IUCN has produced will help us enormously to roll out nature-based solutions on a global scale. So thank you for the work that you've done. It is truly appreciated. But we also know that the cost of renewing and protecting nature is much, much more than public money can provide. So we're going to have to mobilize private finance as well. And one of the barriers preventing action on a scale that matches the crisis is that so much of what nature provides us is simply not valued. And, and so much of its destruction is not counted as a cost. So the Amazon, for instance, critically important on so many levels for human survival is worth more today dead than it is alive. So among the many other initiatives, we're gonna to need to ramp up our efforts to deliver trusted, authentic and reliable carbon markets. And in addition, we will be focusing on tackling the perverse incentives that drive destruction. So incentives that uh, to destroy forests, for example, outstrip those in favor of protecting them by around 40 to one. 
And an example of that uh, at present, the 50 biggest food producing countries between them spend around $700 billion a year in support for often harmful agriculture with only a tiny percentage going to sustainable land use. And that's around four times more than all of the world's aid agencies combined. So imagine the impact if this was redirected, that $700 billion was redirected to reward sustainable practices that help protect the environment. And we'll also be building alliances, north-south producer-consumer countries to remove deforestation from agricultural supply chains. And as we rebuild our economies, as every country in the world must now do following coronavirus, we have a chance to get it right. We have a chance to build back greener and better. And governments around the world have already committed around $9 trillion to the recovery. So how we choose to spend those funds now is going to have ramifications for decades. And the choice is simple. We can stick with the status quo, bailing out high carbon, environmentally damaging industries, locking in decades of emissions, or we can choose to make environmental sustainability and resilience the lens through which we map out our recovery. And I'm delighted that our own prime minister is committed to build back better and build back green. And finally, we know that to speak authoritatively on the international stage, we also have to get our own house in order. So in addition to doubling our ICF to 11.6 billion, we're ramping up our efforts home. We've legislated for net zero by 2050. We're mandating a biodiversity net gain for housing development. We're planting trees on up to, not up to, on 30,000 hectares of land per year by 2025. We're introducing a landmark environment bill to tackle air and water quality, biodiversity loss, waste, and much more. And we're changing our land use subsidies completely so that they now must reward environmental stewardship and the delivery of what we're calling public goods. We're committed to doing absolutely everything we can to turn things around. We know we can't do it alone. And so a lot of our work in the run up to COP is going to be about building alliances of countries and businesses willing to go much further on, on targets to protect land and sea, on supply chains, on land use subsidies, on net zero emissions, on commitments to dramatically increase support for nature based solutions. Coronavirus has completely changed the rules. It is a gigantic wake up call. We, we know we need a fundamental reset. And I'm convinced that if we work together, we absolutely can and must deliver that. So thank you very much for inviting me along today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Lord Goldsmith. Uh, I, I know the UK has uh, a lot on its plate these days. I had millions of questions for you, but unfortunately, the agenda is fully packed. We'll keep that, probably that discussion in the very near future some other time. Well, uh, continuing on the climate theme, uh, let me introduce our next speaker, the Honorable Malik Amin of Pakistan, who is an advisor to the Prime Minister on climate change, as well as an IUCN Vice President. Welcome, Minister Amin. I don't know if uh, probably, uh, probably Minister Amin is not with us or has a connection problem, which can happen, unfortunately. Um, so um, I will, I will get probably get back to him and uh, move to probably our next speaker. Uh, who is uh, the French ambassador, so uh, who I hope is with us. So we are pleased to have him, uh, the French ambassador for environment, the Honorable Jan Worling with us today too. So um, Jan, if you're there, just reach out, just to make sure that everybody is, 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 is with I'm us. with you. I'm with you, yes. Very good, that's great. So. France is also the host of the next IUCN World Conservation Congress in January 2021. So Mr. Ambassador, the European Union is rolling out a Green New Deal with ambitious, I must say, climate and biodiversity goals. So could you probably just tell us a little bit more about France's uh, priorities in regards to nature-based solutions? Uh, Jan, I don't know, you, you will be speaking in French or in English just to make sure? Yes, in French, if it's possible. Of course, yes. possible. So for all our viewers who are watching us live today on YouTube, so you will have uh, the translation that will appear in the captions below. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Merci, cher ministre, cher participant. C'est un honneur pour moi de représenter la France au sein de ce panel de haut niveau pour le lancement du standard de l'UICN sur les solutions fondées sur la nature. Permettez-moi de vous transmettre d'ailleurs les respects de Madame Barbara Pompili, ministre 
la transition écologique qui aurait dû être avec nous ce matin, mais euh, qui n'a pu euh, se libérer. Changement climatique et érosion de la biodiversité sont deux défis euh, majeurs dont les interactions se révèlent tant euh, dans les pressions qui les causent et les aggravent que dans les solutions euh, pour y répondre. Nous devons promouvoir des solutions porteuses de co-bénéfices qui optimisent les synergies entre protection de la biodiversité et protection du climat. Les solutions fondées sur la nature illustrent ces synergies. Elles sont des réponses pertinentes aux crises environnementales actuelles. Tout en s'appuyant sur les écosystèmes en et en les protégeant, les solutions fondées sur la nature peuvent améliorer la résilience des sociétés au changement climatique et réduire les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. J'ai cité la lutte contre le changement climatique, mais j'aurais pu citer d'autres exemples de co-bénéfices des solutions fondées sur la nature, comme l'amélioration de notre santé et la crise sanitaire actuelle l'a particulièrement mis en exergue. Il nous faut repenser notre manière de faire des politiques publiques en adoptant une approche intégrée et en la concrétisant sur le terrain. Cet impératif s'est trouvé renforcé avec la crise du coronavirus. Nous avons eu l'illustration concrète que toutes ces crises environnementales, sanitaires, économiques, sociales, sont intrinsèquement liées et font partie d'un tout. Cette approche intégrée se manifeste au sein de l'Union européenne comme vous l'avez cité, avec la mise en œuvre du pacte vert et la volonté des décideurs de s'attaquer aux causes profondes de la destruction de la biodiversité et du changement climatique afin d'impulser les changements durables et transformateurs. Dans ce contexte, nous avons donc une opportunité pour promouvoir les solutions fondées sur la nature et accélérer leur déploiement. En effet, même si la question des solutions fondées sur la nature prend de l'ampleur, il existe encore un écart entre les discours et la réalité de mise en œuvre sur le terrain. La publication du standard de l'UICN arrive donc à point nommé. La France est persuadée que cet outil offrira une méthodologie et une grille de lecture qui va non seulement renforcer la mise en œuvre des projets, utilisant les solutions fondées sur la nature, mais aussi asseoir leur crédibilité et leur légitimité. Ce standard permettra également de mieux qualifier les projets, faisant appel à ces solutions, ce qui pourra permettre d'accroître leur financement. Il peut également servir de point d'entrée pour une réflexion plus générale sur les notions d'économie fondée sur la nature et d'emploi fondé sur la nature dans le contexte d'élaboration des fameux plans de relance dont tout le monde parle en ce moment. L'enjeu essentiel réside maintenant dans la promotion de ce standard afin que les différentes parties prenantes l'utilisent. Je désire ici saluer le vaste travail de consultation de l'UICN qu'il a effectué pour l'élaboration du standard qui contribue déjà grandement à sa promotion. Il est également indispensable que ce standard soit porté au niveau politique. La France est engagée pour poursuivre la promotion des solutions fondées sur la nature et les travaux de l'UICN. Je pense par exemple à la COP26 et aux opportunités développées par le Royaume-Uni qui vient de s'exprimer pour illustrer concrètement la convergence biodiversité et climat et à la COP15 de la Convention de diversité biologique où nous pourrons là aussi dans le cadre de l'avant-projet de, de, qui nous est soumis pour la période post-2020, euh, évoquer des cibles sur les solutions fondées sur la nature, euh, solutions que euh, la France soutient bien évidemment. Je pense enfin et surtout au Congrès mondial de l'UICN que vous avez évoqué, qui se déroulera à Marseille en France en 2021, en janvier 2021. La question des solutions fondées sur la nature fera l'objet d'une attention particulière, tant au niveau des événements, organisées que dans certaines motions qui seront portées et soutenues par la France et qui font la promotion de ces solutions. La publication du standard de l'UICN sur les solutions fondées sur la nature nous montre que les outils pour l'élaboration de politiques plus intégrées et durables existent. Il est maintenant temps pour l'action politique, afin, il est temps pour l'action politique d'en faire la promotion et favoriser leur mise en œuvre. Je tiens encore à saluer le travail de l'UICN et je vous remercie pour votre attention. Je dis, je dis que je vous souhaite la chance de vous voir en janvier à Marseille. So, right, thank you so much. I think we have with us Minister Amin, uh, even if uh, I think it's a slight uh, orientation problem. Now that's very good. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, perfect, brilliant. Okay, okay. Thank, thanks a lot, and Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen.
uh, good morning, good afternoon, and I'm very glad to be here. And I would like to thank IUCN for this uh, wonderful new tool that is being launched, the uh, Nature-Based Solutions uh, Toolkit uh, and the standards. And I think, think this is something that is badly needed at this time by the world. Um, as we go through the pandemic, we've realized two things. One is that there is an interconnectedness amongst us that we cannot escape from. Uh, what happened in a small part of the world quickly spread all, all over the world within a month and we were all affected. The other one is the interconnectedness with nature. That is also a relationship we cannot escape from and we need to deal with that together. Uh, within this relationship with nature, I think uh, what we have been taught is that we need to respect the boundaries uh, uh, with nature and you know the, the pandemic, the zoonotic pandemic is a reaction to us uh, you know, going beyond our boundaries. And the other thing is that we need a rebalancing act with nature as we get out of the pandemic. We cannot you know, uh, go out the same pathway that we came into the pandemic with. And this is where the importance of the nature-based solutions comes in. Uh, in Pakistan, we realized these two issues and within this uh, context, uh, within the pandemic uh, period during the lockdown, we announced what was called the green stimulus. That green stimulus was basically premised on two things. One is that we need to protect nature if, and we needed to protect us. And the other thing was that while we protect nature, we also need to create jobs for the people. The huge COVID related unemployment that has occurred in countries like Pakistan needs to be addressed. Uh, so we, we got these two things together and we looked at three main initiatives that we basically triggered during this period. Uh, one was uh, uh, the tree planting initiative called the Billion Tree Tsunami, which was already going on in one of our provinces. We had already plans of increasing it to 10 billion trees. But what we injected during this period was the idea of cash for work programs for people to get uh, jobs while protecting nature. And we increased the, you know, the job opportunities within that program from 30,000 to 80,000 within the pandemic period. And we need to take it uh, and we have planned to take it to, uh, to you know, 600,000. All of this is creating nature protection plus giving us jobs. The other thing was protected areas initiative. Again, this was, is an, was an initiative which was premised on the idea of enhancing our protected area coverage within Pakistan, but also uh, more importantly, uh, actually protecting whatever gets notified as a protected area. And in that we benefited from the green list uh, uh, toolkit that we had from IUCN. But again, at the end of it, it was protecting nature, but also creating jobs but because we're going to be starting our National Park Service. And we hope by September, we'll have 5,000 young, passionate people on the ground protecting nature and creating jobs. Uh, the third one is called Clean, uh, Clean Green Initiative, which is basically to look at solid waste and liquid waste, you know, the stuff we are putting back into nature, which is not good for nature. And how do we manage that in urban areas? Again, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, jobs triggered uh, along with it. So all of these, uh, and I, I would say, you know, 75% of this whole green stimulus is based on nature-based solutions. It is based on the premise that if you invest in nature, nature pays you back. And that is what Pakistan has learned. We are putting our own money into this whole initiative. In fact, diverting funds from from you know, uh, priorities such as health and education into this uh, uh, process. Uh, we were the first country to actually repurpose $200 million of World Bank fund towards nature protection during the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic period uh, is a big crisis, but we have taken it up as an opportunity. We have approved our first EV policy during this pandemic. We have approved in the cabinet a shift from Euro 2 to Euro 5. All of these are, all of these are are issues which are helping air pollution, uh, climate change mitigation, nature protection, creating jobs at the, at the end of it. So, so I think that you know this IUCN initiative is very well timed for countries like Pakistan to learn from because it will help us plan better. It will help us uh, execute our nature-based solution strategy better, and it will help us monitor better. So, it is the you know the the exact sort of uh, knowledge-based tool that countries like Pakistan were looking for. Uh, and I think this is what the world can learn from. And this is uh, 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 going to be a big contribution on the lines of the green list, the red list, and all the knowledge-based tools that IUCN has provided to the world. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Minister Amin. Indeed, Pakistan's leadership role uh, on the international restoration effort is, is a great example. Thank you very much. Well, um, just a, a brief message for uh, our audience uh, who are watching us today live on IUCN's YouTube channel. So you can, of course, send us your remarks, comments, questions, and representatives from IUCN will be glad to respond to all your questions uh, in, in the meantime. Thank you. So um, it's time to, to move on. Uh, I would like to ask uh, IUCN's Global Director of Nature-Based Solutions, uh, Stuart McGuinness, to tell us a bit about this new global standard. So Stuart, how are you? If Hello, Asha, how are you? Great to see you. You've even grown a mustache since the last <laughs> So it suits you really well. So I had the pleasure to talk to you earlier this year on my show on CNBC. So uh, this standard is, is uh, something very exciting uh, during this timing, I mean. So what, what, what is it really and uh, who can use it? Uh, tell us a little bit about the standard, Stuart. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Asha. Those of us who have been working on nature-based solutions for quite some while could not, not in our wildest dreams, have anticipated just how much the MBS concept has taken root since 2016 when IUCN members approved a, a clear and widely accepted definition for the first time. And we've heard a lot about that this morning, how this momentum is building. It's really heartening to, to, to see how rapidly MBS is being mainstreamed in national plans and policies. And uh, for example, according to a report that IUCN and the University of Oxford did uh, last year, 130 countries have now included MBS in their national climate uh, plans. Accelerate, and again, we've heard that this morning when we begin to contemplate the economic recovery from COVID-19. Uh, we know from taking lessons from the 2008 financial crisis that those recovery packages in the United States, which targeted what we now call MBS, created over three times more jobs for the same investment compared to similar in, uh, interventions in more traditional sectors. Now that's all good news. However, this rapid increase in recognition of the potential of MBS also brings about some challenges, especially when you consider that for MBS to be successful, and Lord Goldsmith has highlighted this already, it's gonna have to be implemented, not just by conservationists, but by other organizations, private sector companies and government departments who do not deal with conservation science and natural resources on a day-to-day -day basis. Furthermore, several commentators are, are, have rightfully highlighted concerns that good intentions behind nature-based solutions could be misdirected by, for example, replacing rich and diverse ecosystems with simplified land management approaches like single species plantations or very importantly, undermining the livelihoods of indigenous peoples and other local communities by de facto expropriation of their access and use rights and undermining their decision-making authority over their traditional territories. So the standard sets out to answer key questions we in IUCN have been asked frequently. What do practitioners need to pay attention to in order to deliver high quality and effective nature-based solutions and how do they know when they are on target or alternatively where improvements are required? The 800 experts we consulted in the process were very clear that the purpose of the standard should be to help practitioners and policymakers improve nature-based solution interventions rather than set a single definitive minimum threshold. And so the standard works by enabling practitioners to systematically answer eight key questions. I won't go through all those key questions, but I'm going to highlight three. For example, what, to what degree is nature-based solutions equipped to safeguard and improve the associated biodiversity values? Is the nature-based solution intervention economically feasible? Does decision-making decision sufficiently include key stakeholders, and is it adequately rooted in a rights-based approach? These are the sorts of things that we need to that need to be answered in order to know if nature-based solutions is on target. So progress on each of the standards eight criteria is assessed with a series of indicators. The standard provides guidance on the rationale for each indicator, and then indicator by indicator guides the practitioner in its assessment. By aggregating 
individual indicator scores, it is possible to distinguish those intervention parameters that could be considered strong from those that we would consider adequate, from those that are only partially addressed and from those that are currently not sufficient. It's intended that the standard could be applied both to assess specific field-based interventions, as well as to evaluate national or subnational programs and policies. And there is now quite a bit of interest from both the public and private finance sectors in using the standard as an investment screening tool. We are currently in the process of setting up an international standards committee, which will be charged with the oversight of the standard, including periodic revisions to improve its rigor, its utility and its applicability. Finally, I would encourage any participant who is interested in piloting or applying the standard to reach out to my colleagues in IUCN and join the standards user group. By doing so, they will become part of a community of practice whose experience can then be fed into further improvements and revisions of the standards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. So, so what I understand is everyone can use the standard, really. It's a wide ranging user group and uh, small scale, larger scale projects, everyone. So this, this, this is brilliant. Thank you, Stuart. Well, um, the impacts of uh, climate change are most visible in the Arctic. And at the same time, we note from history that the use of natural resources can undermine the rights of indigenous peoples. So we are very honored today to have Dr. Dali Sambo Doro, is, who is the international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. And she's also an IUCN voice for indigenous people. Hello, Dolly. Uh, I hope you can hear me. So could you please uh, tell us how you view nature-based solutions and how the standard can help reconcile the need to sustainably deploy nature in the fight against climate change while respecting the rights of indigenous peoples? First of all, uh, let me say that I welcome the formal launch of the standard and uh, find that my remarks will um, mesh very well with the um, brief summary of the standard. And allow me to answer by illustrating the importance of the rights of Indigenous peoples and in particular Indigenous knowledge. For Indigenous peoples worldwide, our well-being depends upon the environment and its biodiversity. In 2007, the General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which affirms the distinct status, rights, and role of Indigenous peoples worldwide. It explicitly affirms our right of self-determination, which is recognized as the prerequisite to the exercise and enjoyment of all other human rights. The UN Declaration also recognizes the profound relationship that we have with our lands, territories, and resources. Therefore, when we speak of nature-based solutions, it's crucial for the world community to respect and recognize the interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible human rights of Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are the first peoples to practice sustainable development. Our values, customs, cultures, languages, and institutions have been maintained and supported by our distinct communities based upon our sustainable practices, often in harsh environments like the Arctic environment. Through the accommodation of the rights of indigenous peoples within every political and legal arena, the international community can make a significant contribution to the survival of the planet, its diverse cultures, and its biodiversity. One of our major contributions to nature-based solutions can be found in the wealth of intricate knowledge that we have accumulated over thousands of years. We hold highly developed, sophisticated, and detailed knowledge of the natural world. Like human rights, we see every aspect of our environment as interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible. We view our ecosystems and the environment in a holistic fashion. If one element is altered, 
the whole environment will be impacted. The Inuit of Chikotka and the Russian Federation, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, whose traditional lands and territory comprise just over 40% of the Arctic, our survival and sustenance is based upon our profound relationship, our intimate relationship with the environment and our observations and the deep understanding that we have of all living creatures. And our food security is directly tied to the health of our ecosystems and biodiversity. So for Inuit, food security is the natural right to be a part of the ecosystem to access food and to caretake, protect, and respect all life, land, water, and air. We have defined indigenous knowledge as a systematic way of thinking applied to phenomena across biological, physical, cultural, and spiritual systems. It includes insights based on evidence acquired through direct and long-term experiences, and extensive and multi-generational observations, lessons, and skills. It has developed over millennia and is still developing in a living process, including knowledge acquired today and in the future. And it's also passed on from generation to generation. In order to achieve genuine nature-based solutions, there's a need for both indigenous knowledge and science. The ethical co-production of knowledge toward nature-based solutions may be mutually complementary. It has the potential to produce new knowledge and ultimately to contribute to sound and durable nature-based solutions. There's extraordinary power in indigenous knowledge, especially in the context of the dramatic and rapid changes that we're seeing in the Arctic and elsewhere due to climate change and many other human generated causes. Through the necessary elements of trust, respect for and recognition of our human rights, indigenous peoples can contribute solutions to the wide range of problems that we're all facing. If the objective of nature-based solutions is to be employed across all sectors, indigenous peoples must be included. Taking this further, the right of self-determination of indigenous peoples, our conceptions of sustainable development and our knowledge systems are all necessary factors to genuinely ensure equity and substantive equality between indigenous peoples and the rest of the world. We are at the heart of nature-based solutions. Yanak, thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective. Thank you very much, Dr. Doro. It's fascinating. Indeed, we have a lot to learn from indigenous people about conservation, sustainability, and simply taking care of nature. Thank you very much for sharing. Well, if nature-based solution is to really deliver and go to scale, it will need proactive private sector engagement. We need the private sector, obviously. And we are honored today to have Mr. Sonny Verghese, the chair of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and group CEO of Olam International joining us today. Sonny, I hope you can hear me. So it's as a business leader, what is your view of nature-based solutions and what is uh, required actually today to support business on this sustainable journey? Uh, thank you, Asha. Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a rare privilege to be invited to participate in uh, the IUCN forum. Uh, and I'm told I'm the only private sector voice or representative in this forum. And uh, this is one of the missing things in terms of how public and private sector can collaborate to achieve true transformational change. As all of you know, the last biodiversity convention, the Aichi Biodiversity Convention, which was signed by more than 190 countries in 2010, and which had five strategic objectives, 20 goals, and 130 targets to be achieved by 2020, the year uh, this year, we were supposed to achieve those goals and targets. Only four out of the 20 goals have been achieved. So I've been asking myself, why are we lagging behind in achieving the UN SDGs? 
or even in terms of the trajectory of achieving global warming under two degrees or one and a half degrees centigrade is because some of the action gap between these broad agreements, which are all miraculous agreements, and actually action on the ground is the fact that we are not able to convince citizenry and people, the seven and a half billion people that inhabit this planet, that they should change. We have to be the change that we want to see in others. If you can't engage change at the individual level, we have no hope in hell of changing the world. Secondly, our companies have to change. And if private sector is not part of the solution, I don't think we're going to achieve meaningful change. Private sector, not just individual companies, but whole sectors, the pharma sector, the global food and agri sector, the energy sector, all of us will have to have sectoral roadmaps in how we can transition our sectors into becoming more sustainable. Wearing the twin hats today of chair of the WBCSD, as well as the co-founder and uh, group CEO of OLAM, and we are a leading global agri business, for me, this initiative of uh, global standards for nature-based solutions that is being launched today by IUCN is extremely timely, like all the other speakers before me have uh, reinforced. And why is that this case? Because for true transformation, and I'm going to speak from the perspective of the global food and agricultural system, which as most of us can recognize is broken. Uh, we account for 25% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. We account for 70% of the world's biodiversity collapse. We account for 71% of the world's freshwater withdrawals. How are we going to feed a growing population of 9.5 billion people by 2050 without destroying the planet if you're going to produce food, feed, and fiber that we all need to survive on this basis? We cannot. So the one way of trying to fix this problem is through a landscape approach. The world today faces three major developmental challenges. The climate emergency, the collapse of biodiversity and nature, and third, social inequities. We all know the problem on climate emergency. We have a 570 gigaton carbon budget, which means we can only emit 17 and a half gigatons per year, against which we are now emitting 42 gigatons. How do we, by 2050, go to a zero emissions place? That's the problem as far as climate emergency is concerned. In terms of biodiversity, we already heard the uh, statistics from the British minister about the fact that we lost 40 billion hectares of forest land in the last 40 years. And we have lost almost 40% of our mangroves in the last 40 years. And I can go on and on in terms of the, the, uh, the collapse of biodiversity. So unless we take an area-based landscape approach across the food sector, but beyond the food sector, by considering all the relevant factors to transform agriculture uh, within that bounded space, we are not going to really truly achieve transformation, which means how do we produce food, feed, and fiber more sustainably? Secondly, how do people live and work in those habitats? How do we protect the natural habitats? How do we deliver the ecosystem services that we need to produce the food, feed, and fiber? And finally, how do we govern all of these issues? So how do we go towards regenerative agriculture? How do we go towards a ladder of livelihoods transformation for our farmers and our uh, uh, agricultural uh, producers? And therefore, I just want to complete with very quickly two practical examples, being from the private sector. For us, it is about action. So at OLAM, we have uh, partnered with the Rainforest Alliance as well as USAID, USAID in Mexico to transform the livelihoods of 100,000 coffee farmers and to reforest about 4,000 hectares of land. And we have already given uh, half a million improved coffee seedlings we have improved productivity by 60% through the agronomic advice and crop care advice that we provide these farmers. We have planted about 40,000 forest trees and shade trees in that ecosystem. And uh, as a result, we believe that we will be able to eat, help Mexico meet its target of achieving zero deforestation by 2030, but more importantly, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 10 million tons. And the second and final example that I want to give you is in our almond orchards in California, we have created natural uh, habitats for the uh, honeybee population by having native flowers, ground cover crops like clover, and then stopping the spraying of any insecticide during the pollination season, and also making sure that uh, we can uh, uh, prevent the collapse of these honeybee populations. So 17,400 honeybee populations in that habitat, we have been able to protect as a result. 
so unless we can come together in a landscape approach collaboratively, we will not be able to transform uh, agriculture and food systems uh, to make it more sustainable. Well, thank you, Sonny. It's really encouraging to hear the private sector so committed, engaged. Well, that's brilliant, all the examples that you've mentioned. I think we can really applaud those efforts and commitment. Well done for that. Well done. Well, um, we will move on to disaster risk reduction, which is one of the societal challenges nature-based solutions can contribute to. Today, we are also pleased to have uh, the Honorable Mami Mitsu Tori with, with us. She is, uh, as you know, the Assistant Secretary General for the UN's Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Let me just probably ask you a question. So can nature-based solution in this new IUCN global standard support risk reduction efforts? And where are you know the opportunities to do so? So uh, should nature-based solutions be included in national strategies for disaster risk reduction? Um. Thank you very much, Asha. Um, it is a pleasure to participate in this event to mark the launch of the global standard for nature-based solutions for societal challenges. It will make a tremendous contribution to our understanding of the links between the natural world and disasters. As you know, climate emergency is doubling extreme weather events over the last 20 years. At the same time, degraded ecosystems and biodiversity loss exacerbate the impacts of disasters on all populations, but in particular for many poor and vulnerable communities. Therefore, it is more vital than ever that we understand the role that nature-based solutions can play in reducing disaster risk. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the global blueprint for reducing disaster losses, adopted five years ago. And one of its four priorities for action is a call for UN member states and actually all stakeholders, including the private sector, to strengthen their disaster risk governance the importance of disaster risk governance has been cast in a new light by failures to act on the warnings that the world could sooner or later face a pandemic on the scale of COVID-19, sadly. So what do we mean by disaster risk governance? This is a question related to what Mr. Virgis mentioned. It means having clear, actionable plans backed by legislation and strong institutions to ensure that we reduce existing disaster risks and avoid the creation of new ones. And this includes by protecting our environment. NBS must be a key consideration to strengthen disaster risk governance. The new standard lays out in clear terms how nature-based solutions provide a healthy ecosystem, whether it be coastal, marine, or terrestrial, so that people and property are protected from natural hazards. Now, we hear the term natural disasters frequently, but there is no such thing as a natural disaster. If we can make our ecosystem resilient, if we can reduce the vulnerability of people by eliminating poverty, among other things, natural hazards, including extreme weather events, do not have to become disasters. But what we are actually seeing is degraded ecosystem, such as disappearing mangrove forests, denuded hillsides, resulting in thousands of hundreds of lives being lost in storms, floods, and landslides across the world. Natural hazard becoming disasters. So we must stop this now, and the new global standard will provide the foundation to turn things around. It is estimated that mangroves reduce annual flooding for more than 18 million people globally. Here, where I live in Switzerland, the government spends 150 million Swiss francs every year on forest protection, reducing the risk of landslides and avalanche, while at the same time maintaining biodiversity, carbon sequestration, and supporting tourism. In my own country, Japan, trees are planted as protective green belts along the coasts. And when this is combined with land zoning and protective infrastructure, it con contributes to multi-hazard 
risk reduction measures, including from tsunamis, a deadly hazard. These nature-based solutions need to be scaled up and sustainable so that they become a stronger focus for international cooperation on disaster risk reduction. COVID-19 has cast new light on the systemic nature of risk that we face, that everything is connected, as the minister from Pakistan has told us. A public health disaster quickly turned into a socioeconomic disaster at a scale we have never seen. And this is why governments should draft their national disaster risk reduction strategies with a clear understanding of the systemic and connected nature of risk. And importantly, the strategies must be funded appropriately into rural development planning and the management of mountains, rivers, floodplains, drylands, wetlands, and all other areas prone to drought and floods. Strengthen, please, your disaster risk governance and invest in it. This is the key message we will be conveying on October the 13th, the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, when we will launch a new Words into Action guide on nature-based solutions. Words into Action is a series of guidelines with tools for practitioners to implement disaster risk reduction on the ground. This one on nature-based solutions has been developed with the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction and will echo many messages and key points of this new global standard. We at the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction look forward to continuing working with IUCN and partners to take nature-based solutions to scale for sustainable disaster risk reduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mami Mitsutori. Thank you for these insights. Now, last but not least, we will invite uh, Mr. Bertrand Valkener from the French Development Agency, <coughs> Agence Française de Développement, uh, to say a few closing words. So the Agence Française de Développement has funded this new global standard. Therefore, can you please share with us some of your reflections on what you have heard today? Or perhaps tell us uh, what uh, the Agence Française de Développement's plans are going to be looking forward. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à toutes et à tous, mesdames et messieurs les ministres, euh, monsieur l'ambassadeur Yann Verling, mesdames et messieurs les participants. En tant que directeur général délégué de l'Agence Française de Développement, je suis très heureux de participer à cet événement aujourd'hui. Le lancement de cette norme est le fruit en effet d'un travail extrêmement approfondi qui a été conduit à la surface du globe, ce qui n'est finalement pas si commun en termes d'exercice, qui a mobilisé de très nombreuses parties prenantes, organisations de la société civile, entreprises, États, collectivités locales. Et c'était dans le cadre de l'activité de financement de ces travaux auxquels nous avons participé, au nom de la France, extrêmement important pour nous. Donc aujourd'hui, c'est un événement qui, de notre point de vue, marque le début d'un chemin, le début d'un chemin vers plus de prise en compte de la biodiversité, vers plus d'intégration des solutions fondées sur la nature pour participer à la transition écologique, à la lutte contre le changement climatique, à la lutte aussi, d'une certaine façon, contre des pandémies comme celles que nous traversons aujourd'hui. Donc cette, cette brique que nous posons dans le mur que nous sommes en train de construire ensemble est extrêmement importante à, cette, à cet égard. La deuxième chose que je voudrais dire, c'est que dans ce chemin qui s'ouvre devant nous, nous avons donc aujourd'hui un standard, nous avons huit critères qui ont été définis, nous avons des indicateurs qui sont en place, mais la partie la plus importante, et cela a déjà été indiqué par certains présentateurs un peu plus tôt ce jour, la partie la plus importante qui est la mise en œuvre sur le terrain, concrète, par les différents acteurs, est devant nous. C'est vrai dans le secteur de l'agriculture, par exemple, qui est particulièrement importante au titre de l'intégration de la prise en compte de la biodiversité. C'est vrai également en matière de développement urbain, puisqu'on sait que le développement des villes aujourd'hui se fait du fait de l'étalement urbain par l'artificialisation des sols. Et donc, ce sont deux exemples de secteurs dans lesquels beaucoup d'initiatives sont en cours et il nous manquait à l'échelle internationale un, un label, une méthodologie commune qui répondait, et c'est d'ailleurs un des points importants 
de la, des travaux qui ont été conduits par l'UICN, qui répondait à une demande des acteurs du terrain pour être en capacité d'intégrer la composante biodiversité, travailler sur des solutions fondées sur la nature pour conduire leurs projets de développement, pour conduire leurs projets économiques. Donc, ce qui est très important pour nous à partir de ce jour, ce sont tous les pilotes, qui vont, tous les prototypes qui vont pouvoir être mis en œuvre, qui vont pouvoir se déployer à la surface du globe. Et je, je souhaite, j'espère, que nous aurons l'occasion d'autres réunions à l'avenir pour échanger, pour parler, pour débattre sur les solutions qui auront été trouvées par les uns et les autres, pour travailler, par exemple, sur les mangroves, ça a été cité, pour travailler à des programmes de reforestation, mais qui intègrent également un équilibre économique, un équilibre social également, euh, extrêmement important pour rendre compatibles les actions menées en matière de lutte contre le changement climatique, par exemple, et le souhait d'associer des populations qui sont touchées par ces différents projets. Un autre message important pour moi ce jour est de vous indiquer que c'est un jeu collectif que nous voulons engager maintenant. L'intervenante précédente a notamment mentionné, a parlé de stratégie territoriale, de planification, et c'est effectivement extrêmement important qu'à l'échelle d'un territoire, il n'y a pas que les entreprises ou des collectivités, il y a aussi des groupes d'individus, des collectifs qui peuvent se saisir de ces solutions qui sont aujourd'hui proposées. Et ces collectifs, l'intérêt, c'est de pouvoir intégrer dans le plan de développement d'un territoire une composante sur le capital écologique sur le capital de biodiversité, lui donner une valeur. Aujourd'hui, trop souvent, la biodiversité est perçue, est perçue comme un problème ou comme un frein au développement d'un projet économique. Demain, nous avons le souhait que ça devienne une valeur et que ça devienne une composante qu'il est important de préserver. Et c'est ça qui sera au cœur du jeu collectif et des enjeux sur lesquels on souhaite que les parties prenantes puissent, puissent travailler. Voilà. Donc, Mise en œuvre sur le terrain, on est au départ, labellisation, création de, de prototypes, et puis évidemment la question absolument cruciale du financement de ces initiatives, comme cela a pu être rappelé. Alors un petit mot pour vous dire que, à titre personnel, l'Agence française de développement, à la demande du gouvernement français, travaille aujourd'hui à mobiliser plus de financement qu'elle ne faisait jusqu'à présent sur l'intégration et la protection de la biodiversité dans le cadre de ces projets de développement et nous avons l'ambition d'atteindre 1 milliard d'euros par an d'engagement d'ici 2025 sur la prise en compte de la biodiversité. Je souhaite et j'espère que nous aurons l'occasion de travailler sur des projets qui intégreront ces standards et les normes, la norme de l'UICN telle qu'elle est lancée aujourd'hui. Et puis un deuxième point important sur le financement, c'est un rendez-vous que je vous propose et auquel je vous invite en novembre prochain à Paris, à l'occasion du Forum de Paris pour la paix, puisque la France accueillera un sommet des banques publiques de développement. Ce sont 450 institutions qui sont dans le, dans, dans le, monde, dans le monde entier. Et ces 450 institutions, elles représentent 10% de l'investissement annuel mondial. Ces 450 institutions publiques ont un mandat qui leur est confié par leurs décideurs politiques, par leur gouvernement. Et ces 450 institutions, eh bien, nous avons l'ambition, et nous y travaillons aujourd'hui, avec nombre d'entre elles qui sont déjà mobilisées sur les enjeux de transition écologique et de transition climatique, nous avons l'ambition qu'elles prennent davantage en compte la biodiversité, qu'elles prennent évidemment en compte cette norme lancée aujourd'hui par l'UICN, parce que, évidemment, si vous avez 10% de l'investissement mondial qui, à terme, a pour mandat d'intégrer la biodiversité dans son action et dans ses plans de financement, vous imaginez aisément l'impact mondial que ceci pourra avoir sur la, la protection de notre planète et la recherche de solutions bénéfiques pour ben, nos écosystèmes, pour l'homme également, comme cela a pu être rappelé dans le contexte de la pandémie actuelle. Voilà les quelques points que je souhaitais faire aujourd'hui. Encore une fois, merci à l'UICN pour l'intensité des travaux et merci à toutes et tous qui vous mobilisez aujourd'hui pour porter haut et fort cet engagement en faveur de la biodiversité et de la nature. Et je souhaite qu'on ait l'occasion de se reparler dans quelques mois ou années pour voir concrètement sur le terrain comment tout ceci aura pu être déployé. Je vous remercie.
Merci Bertrand Valkener et avec plaisir pour cela. So thank you to all of you, to all our speakers for participating today in this launch event. We have heard a lot today about the benefits of nature-based solutions and the growing interest there is in this new global standard. IUCN looks forward to working with you to accelerate the transition to a more sustainable future than one that actually works with nature, not against it. So the new uh, global standard will be available via the IUCN website uh, at uh, 1 p.m. Central European time today to download a copy uh, or to find out more information about IUCN's work on nature-based solutions please visit the website iucn.org. There will also be a press briefing following this event at noon, and then a panel discussion later on nature-based solution standard at 4 p.m. Central European time this afternoon. Well, my name is Asha Sampert, and it has been a pleasure to host today's launch event. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching. Goodbye.